Scientific theory is only a simplified model of the real world. The better we understand the reality, the closer to it become these models replacing each other. The first laws of physics, Newton laws, were extremely simple. The world also seemed simple. Material bodies moved and interacted with each other under Newton laws, and of space was a background that performed just the role of a scene. The scene where every point and every direction were just like all the others. In other words, the space was considered to be homogeneous and isotropic. In the 20th century, the rapid development of science led to the appearance of the famous relativity theory by Einstein. Newton laws continued to exist, but they became merely a particular case of this new theory. Surely the contribution of the general relativity to our physical world outlook is extremely high. First of all, the relativity theory explained a number of effects that take place in our solar system. One of them is the light bending differently from what the Newton theory predicted. The second effect is the precession of the perihelion of Mercury, the planet that is closest to the Sun. According to Newton, its orbit is elliptical, but it turned out that Mercury covers a rosette. This was noticed already in the end of the 19th century, and it was unclear why it was so. Only general relativity theory managed to explain it by the curvature of space-time and the vicinity of the Sun. But maybe the most interesting thing that draws attention to the general relativity is the fact that this physical theory was the first to raise and to try to answer the question of the structure and the evolution of the universe as a whole. The space ceased to play the role of an empty scene. According to Einstein theory, massive bodies make the surface of the stage curved and the space itself influences the motion of bodies. However, despite its considerable change of its role, the space still remained isotropic within this new theory. Meanwhile, a variety of researchers has shown the obvious infringements of space isotropy. Though it discovered the substances whose properties varied essentially along different directions. For example, light passing through a crystal could behave in different ways depending on the direction of the beam. However, this is the anisotropy of medium. But how could the space itself be anisotropic? We live on the surface of the planet that rotates around its axis. Because of this rotation, our space has the selected direction that differs from all the others. This direction coincides with that of the axis of rotation of the Earth. In other words, our space is anisotropic. Does this anisotropy affect only the day and night change, or does it affect somehow any other physical processes? A group of Russian scientists from the town of Pushino near Moscow discovered the effect that they called the phenomenon of macroscopic fluctuation. More than 55 years ago, Simon Schnoll, investigating the speed of biological reactions, noticed substantial and persistent dispersion of results of the typical standardized measurements. That is, in the identical samples taken using the same method, in the same conditions, the consecutive measurements of the reaction rate were taken. Absolutely identical standard measurements, but the results were different every time. And the dispersion of results in these measurements apparently surpassed the instrumental error. The attempt to find out the reason for such a removable disorder or for such fluctuations in the measurement results eventually led to the discovery of the phenomenon of macroscopic fluctuation. Making plots of such fluctuations, the so-called histograms, and comparing them, scientists came to the conclusion that this phenomenon had an external reason. Moreover, 
it turned out that it didn't matter which stochastic process was investigated – physical, chemical or biological. The result was identical for all. The phenomenon appeared to be universal. It became clear when the spatially separated experiments were performed, in Pushino the biochemical reaction rate was measured, and in Moscow it was the rate of radioactive decay. When the histograms of measurement results in Pushino and in Moscow were built, these histograms appeared to be very close to each other. That is, they practically coincided. And this result was so stunning that probably for about a year these works were suspended. But then we gradually returned to them and started to study this phenomenon. One of the first and maybe the best studied results is the daily period discovered by means of similar technique in the long lines of measurements of fluctuations and the processes of various nature. The fluctuations of stochastic processes appear to be similar after a period of time equal to the solar day sharp. Moreover, the increase in the accuracy of measurements allowed to reveal another period of recurrence of histograms. This time equal to the stellar day, that is, time which takes the Earth to make a full rotation with regard to the fixed stars. Due to the motion of the Earth around the Sun, this period is a little different from the solar day. And while the first result could be explained by an unknown influence of the Sun, the period equal to stellar day gave only two alternatives. Either it was the galaxy nucleus that influenced stochastic processes, which seemed hardly possible because of the tremendous distance to the source, or the very space was anisotropic. We speak about the space just because our instruments are as much shielded from any external influences as possible. Our object is alpha decay. It is conditioned by the strong interaction and practically does not depend on any fluctuation of temperature or magnetic fields. Thus, due to this universal character, the only factor that comes to mind is the change of space-time itself. The last doubts were thrown away by the experiments with beams of parallel particles, which took off from a source in a fixed direction. The setup was directed at a world pole, which practically coincides with the polar star. And when the time series were obtained with the help of our standard method, it turned out that the daily period disappeared from this time series. Taking measurements for various directions, the scientists came to an unequivocal conclusion. It is a question of anisotropy of space. But these are the results of research on Earth, and the Earth is not all the universe. And what about the open space? There exist the so-called spiral galaxies. They are flat. That is, they have rotation planes and arms located in these planes. And modern astronomical means make it possible to measure the orbital velocities of stars. If a star is far from the center of a galaxy and moves at rather small speed, Newton physics is quite applicable. For example, in order to find the condition of a star motion around the galaxy center, it is enough to equate the centripetal force, mv square by r, to the force of gravitational acting from the galaxy center. The theory says that the squares of these velocities should inversely depend on the distance to the galaxy center. This is Newton's law, and it is derived from Einstein theory in its limits. But we don't observe this. 
Mysteriously, it turns out that instead of vanishing at infinity, this velocity, this square of velocity, tends to a constant, and for each galaxy to its own one. Moreover, sometimes the rotation curve tends to a constant not from above, as one could suggest, but from below. That is, the speed grows with distance from the center, which makes no sense from the point of view of any modern theory. It is really strange. Such a scandalous divergence between the theory and the reality demanded some urgent change. After all, there are lots of spiral galaxies in the universe, and all of them behave in a similar odd manner, refusing to obey either Newton or Einstein. But the demand is one thing, while the reality is another. In fact, people are reluctant to reject the stereotypes and scientific approaches in order to reach specific targets. And it is natural. Why invent a kind of monster in the form of a new mathematical construction? Isn't it easier to suggest that we really see only a part of attracting matter? The way, which was suggested in order to cope with these problems, was to introduce an invisible mass, the so-called dark matter. According to calculations, the amount of this dark matter should be approximately three times larger than that of visible matter. Besides, the radius of its spherical distribution should surpass galaxy radius four or five times. And the characteristics of the dark matter distribution cannot be predicted with the help of galaxy luminosity alone. In order to learn how dark matter is distributed, one should measure the rotation curves. This fact shows the inconsistency of this notion in the theory. Meaning, every time we want to find the dark matter characteristics, we have to measure the curves first. The luminosity alone doesn't help. I would compare a dark matter problem to the one that arose in the last third of the 19th century. It was a problem for which Thompson gave the following description. In the blue sky of science, of physical science, there exist two small cloudlets. The first cloudlet is the impossibility to explain the results of michelson mole experiments from the point of view of the ether theory. As is well known, this cloudlet became the origin of the relativity theory. The second cloudlet is the difference between the experimental result and the theoretical prediction for the black body thermal radiation. This cloudlet gave birth to the quantum mechanics. Now the dark matter, or better say not the dark matter itself, but the experiments which do not have explanations, they probably are the new cloudlet which has now arisen. The problem of dark matter is aggravated nowadays by what earlier served to strengthen Einstein theory and what has now become the basis for the expanding universe model. It's the Hubble effect. The relativity theory predicts that the radiation from the distancing objects shifts to the red end of the spectrum, and the faster the objects move outwards, the larger is the red shift. This is the so-called Doppler effect. Measuring redshifts of the radiation coming from remote objects, Hubble found out that the further an object was, the faster it moved away from us. It made him conclude that the universe was not stationary, but revealed the expansion. This became the basis for the widely known hypothesis of the Big Bang, which gave birth to our universe. Analyzing the measurements, Hubble came to the conclusion that there is a simple linear dependence between the distance to an object and the speed of its motion. The ratio of these two values was called Hubble constant. However, further and more accurate observations brought a surprise. It turned out that Hubble constant isn't constant at all. And to adjust this fact to the accepted model, it was necessary to assume that now the universe is expanding with acceleration.
The measurements of so-called type 1a supernova show that the universe at the present stage of its evolution expands with acceleration. And where could one take a force which would push away all those masses? And this was only the beginning. And now, modifying the equations of the state and introducing the notion of the so-called dark energy, many people try to explain the accelerated recession of the faraway worlds. They speak about some quintessence. They speak about the energy of vacuum, huge energy. The energy which is related to the repulsion in the universe, taking into consideration the amount of the universe mass, it is monstrous. It surpasses the observable mass of the universe with regard to the energy mass equivalence, which is inaccurate with the relativity theory. And again, we have a difference of three to four times. Where does it come from, this energy of repulsion? That is, the whole of 100% is distributed like this. 70% is dark energy, 26% is dark matter, and only 4% remain for the observable matter. What do we have in this case? We try to explain our world, and what we can explain, what we can understand is only about 4%, and 96% is what we cannot understand. I think that such situation is, so to say, generally unacceptable for the majority of physicists. But the problems of the relativity theory do not end with that. There is a brilliant result of general relativity – gravitational lensing. And we widely use this notion, we observe these lenses. They correspond to the situation when there is a cluster of massive objects, for example, a cluster of galaxies. And this cluster of masses bends the rays of light, which come from the objects located further than this cluster. It bends the rays with its gravitational field. It leads to the appearance of several images, in the same way as it is when several images appear in a usual optical lens, when we use it to observe a light source and receive several images of it. This is predicted by the relativity theory and this is observed. But here is a point. The effect is approximately five to six times larger than it should be. Five to six times is not 15%. Finally, there is an empirical tally fischer law, named after the two astronomers who discovered it, which has no explanation. That is, nobody knows how to get it from the equations of relativity theory or from any others. It deals with the galaxy luminosity. It is directly proportional to the fourth power of the orbital velocity of stars at the periphery. What can the luminosity of a galaxy be related to? To the number of stars, to their mass, maybe to galaxy radius, to such things. But where has the fourth power of velocity come from? It is strange that they have noticed it at all. Well, they have. Well done. Still, there is no place for it in the theory. So, on the cosmological scale, the relativity theory has absolutely real problems. It doesn't mean at all that that isn't true. Generally speaking, in this place we use the physically illegal technique. That is, the conclusions of the theory that was tested for one region, namely for the solar system, for the vicinity of the Sun, we apply it to the universe as a whole. But I would like to say that in spite of the fact that we use the illegal technique, meaning that we transfer the approach from one scale to another, we nevertheless are obliged to do this, because without extending the conclusion of the relativity theory as far as we can, we would never be able to understand on what scale, in what limits the general relativity theory starts to glitch, so to speak. The modern physics describes our world rather poorly. There is solid data showing that even Newton's law of gravity doesn't work on scale of several kiloparsec. That is on the distance approximately equal to that from the Sun to the galaxy center. If Newton's law of gravity doesn't work there, then Einstein's theory, which is the logical continuation of the Newton one, works there so much the less. That is, it seems that when we look at those arms of spiral galaxies, and by the way, we don't understand till now why some galaxies have such beautiful spiral patterns, there is a feeling that we don't understand something essential in the nature design. The modern physics is in a state of strong crisis of ideas. 
As it is, the crisis is not so bad, because the crisis means the forthcoming of new deep ideas. Well, I must say that this crisis has become a little protracted. It's been going on already for several decades. And in general, judging by this depth, the result of this crisis could be some absolutely new, non-trivial ideas, which we don't quite understand. There are two possibilities that have opened for the physicists. Either we could try to introduce some new factors to work in accord with relativity theory and with Newton theory. Or we should agree that this new data is the evidence that the general relativity which we use starts to glitch. And we have to pass to some more general theory, which, so to say, is able to include these observations into a new theoretical construction. One of the ways to overcome the existing crisis is to reconsider our view on the seemingly obvious and solid law of physics. Try to correct them or even to change. Mack was the first who posed the question of the motion with regard to some ideal, fixed, absolute space. Actually, the absolute space is formed by the bodies surrounding us, and their distribution is non-uniform. Accelerating the body, we perform it relatively to the external matter, which in general is distributed around the accelerated body and moves relatively to it. It is by no means obvious that, for example, acting with the same force, say, towards big mass or towards small mass, we get the same acceleration of the body. From the formal mathematical point of view, it means that the vector of acceleration, which a body gets under the influence of the force, doesn't coincide with the direction of the accelerating force. There is a temptation to change the gravitation law in a galaxy plane to satisfy the observations. However, it turns out that even if we do it, that is, we change the gravitation law in a galaxy plane, and adjust the theory to observations, it turns out that the so-called globular clusters and other objects that move in a galaxy and do not belong to its plane behave in an absolutely usual way. They obey the usual law of Newton's, Einstein's, Schwarzschild. Globular clusters are the spherical congestions of stars. There are many stars in any of them, but they present compact formations, clusters. And such a cluster, taken as a separate body, belongs to a galaxy but doesn't move in its plane. For example, in our galaxy, which is fortunately also flat and spiral, so that all the problems that we observe in the far away we can touch in our own galaxy, so in our galaxy there is more than 120 globular clusters, and for more than 30 of them the motion parameters have been measured. It appears that with account to statistical reasons, the clusters should spend most part of their time in the remote parts of their orbits, there they move almost slowly, but enigmatically, all of them seem to be present in the vicinity of the center. And this is also a paradox, which is not clear how to explain from the point of view of the existing theory, because the theory demands that they should be not where they are. And then, it turns out that the law which we have to work out, the modification which we have to introduce, has to be different in different directions. In other words, to explain the available empirical data, it is necessary to introduce gravitational anisotropy on galactic scales. Trying to cope with these problems, the scientific community naturally had to work with some formal structures that are inherent to the relativity theory. And such formal structure is the so-called integral of action, a mathematical expression comprising certain variables. It includes the so-called scalar, scalar curvature. And besides, it includes another certain mathematical function which characterizes space-time curvature. And the thing is that all the attempts to modify the theory and its formalism are usually reduced to the attempts to change the scalar, the quantity which stands under the integral and from which all the equations are subsequently deduced. And it doesn't work. 
or better say, it works unsatisfactorily, because nothing prevents performing the procedure itself, but the result is not good enough. It either lacks necessary details, or it doesn't describe what we want, or it describes what we want but some absolutely forcible assumptions were made, and these were taken out of the blue. Since it was impossible to cope with the task, by the change of the scale in the integral of action, another idea appeared. After all, there is another quantity which is called metric and which relates to curvature. This metric, generally speaking, depends on the point at which all the events take place. First, we are going to describe flat galaxies. It is with them that we have problems. And any flat galaxy has a distinct preferential direction, the axis of its rotation. Second, the equivalence principle states that we have no possibility to distinguish experimentally the inertial and the gravitational masses. In other words, in the famous example with the lift invented by Einstein, being in a closed room and performing experiments like dropping balls or observing swinging pendulums, one would not be able to say whether he moves with constant rectilinear acceleration, g 9.8, or he is on the Earth's surface in the gravity field. If we use this axiom, as Einstein did, that we are not able to distinguish between the inertial force and the force of gravity, we should recollect that there are some inertial forces that depend on velocity. For example, these are Coriolis forces. And Coriolis forces decline the bodies from the straight motion if these bodies are in the accelerated and not in the inertial frame. For example, in the rotating one. In other words, Einstein liked to ride in the lift, and I would suggest sweeping on a carousel. Let us turn this carousel, and let us investigate the reality from inside. Drop balls, roll carts, whatever. We will notice with surprise that their motion isn't rectilinear. The boat is deviate. And by the way, the value of this deviation will depend on the speed that we impose to these bodies. And we will notice that there are some forces depending on velocities. We could assume that this is equivalent to some fictitious, conceivable gravitational fields. Gravitation. And now the force of gravitation will depend on velocity. It sounds crazy at first, because on the Earth it is not so. The gravitational law, as it was historically obtained, is related to the fact that there are planets in the solar system, and Tycho Brahe and Jürgen Kepler observed them. Then Newton generalized the empirical laws and deduced the gravitational law of 1 by r squared. But if there are no planets, and the Earth were alone in the sign vicinity, and if we learn about gravitation by observing the rotation of galaxies, we inevitably would come to the conclusion that velocity is in the play. All this means the following. The function which I recollect all the time, in the course of these speculations, this metric, which is the so-called Riemannian one, and depends only on coordinates, generally speaking, may depend also on velocities. That is, on some vectors, or, in other words, on some directions. The ideas of this kind were already investigated. But, on the other hand, in the field of physics, they were investigated insufficiently. And, on the other hand, the mathematics contains a big field known as Finsler's geometry, where all these things are investigated in enough detail. But the physical community doesn't like this name very much, because they don't see the basis for the introduction of any anisotropic amendments into the theory. Meanwhile, it turns out that if we use such metric, such functions in the way we used to do, and add a small correction, small, but depending on these velocities or which is the same on directions, and perform all the formal operations, then we can explain the rotation curves, the mentioned constant appears. And also we can explain tall official law. It takes place only because of the choice of the metric. The space become anisotropic, the curvature in different points depends on velocity. On what velocity? On what vector? Good question. We could discuss it. What moves there? Huh. And what does curve in the curvature? In Einstein theory it looks like this. There are certain masses which make the space-time curved. And now we take into account the motion of these masses. Here are those arrows that appear in every point of the curved space. They are related to the motion of masses. 
And it turns out that if we place another moving mass on this point, the result of the action upon it, its behavior in this curved space-time, whose curvature depends on direction, it turns out that the result leads to the due rotation curves on the one hand and to the tully fischer law on the other hand. All Einstein gravitation remains valid, because everything that concerns point masses, planetary systems, stars remain the same. All the effects of general relativity are present, and the news deals with the cosmological scale, which is a different scale, and for which Einstein theory, in the form we know it, doesn't work properly because it doesn't give the observable results. The researchers in Radio Astronomy Observatory in Pushino have begun the experimental checkup of the theory that might lead to the solution of the problem of spiral galaxies. The preliminary results are hopeful. Some features of space maser radiation coincide with the theory predictions. However, it doesn't give answers to a variety of questions which confront the physicists now. This is not a single riddle. The form of rotation curves of spiral galaxies that confronts this science. But a variety of other problems, too. For example, the specific features of anisotropy of relic 3 degrees radiation, which fills the universe. The relic radiation was discovered long ago. Within the frames of Big Bang hypothesis, it is the direct witness of the moment when, during the evolution of the universe, the radiation and the substance separated from each other. Since then, this radiation continues to fill our universe, gradually cooling down in the process of expansion. For a long time, the relic radiation was considered completely isotropic, which corresponded to the accepted model of the universe that expands uniformly in all directions. However, with the increase of the measurement's accuracy, the relic radiation revealed obvious deviations from the isotropic distribution on the sky. Nowadays, it is certain that the picture of distribution of cosmic microwave background has a complicated structure. The attempts to connect some features of this structure with the non-uniform distribution of matter in the early universe appear inefficient. What were the physical processes that could cause such imperfections is absolutely unclear. Moreover, in the distribution of relic radiation, there were found so strange regularities that the mass media called them world axis of evil. And nowadays the explanation of features of anisotropy of relic radiation is considered one of the major problems not only for cosmology, but also for all science. Various models presenting the features of the relic radiation in the form of various geometrical figures are now under construction. Today, one of them is generally accepted. But if it appears possible to prove that the anisotropy of cosmic microwave background is described by geometrical figures, and if it is possible to test it in reliable experiments, then the number of theories that can describe real universe will essentially decrease. Depending on the kind of geometrical figures we get, we can speak about the macroscopic arrangement of the universe, not in the vicinity of our Earth or in our galaxy, but of the universe as a whole. The development of observation facilities made it possible to show that the process of the faraway object's dispersion goes differently in different directions. This can be also related to the global anisotropy of our universe. From the moment of discovery of the effect, which is now called Hubble effect, that is the dispersion of the faraway cosmological objects, galaxies first of all, there was a latent belief that all the galaxies disperse similarly from any observer in the universe, similarly in all directions. That is, the universe expansion was considered isotropic. However, recently, a group of astrophysicists decided to check this fact, and they built a map of the rates of dispersion for approximately equidistant galaxies. 
it was found that the galaxies at the distances of up to 100 megaparsec disperse from our solar system with different rates. The difference is about 13 to 15 percent in different directions. If we can find the extremes, both minima and maxima for such deviations, it turns out that there are not less than two maxima and two minima. That is, the distribution of Hubble parameter on the sky is quadruple. The similar picture was discovered for the most remote space objects – quasars. In the work of our compatriot Oleg Titov, who works in the Australian Observatory now, it was shown that the small tangent motion of quasars that can be unmistakably registered when observing for a sufficient period of time also gives such a map that it is possible to see correlation in their motion. It seems that they should move stochastically, like in the Brownian motion. But the regularity is well observed, and in this regularity the quadrupole is the first to appear. One can see that this quadrupole overlaps the map of the quadrupole anisotropy of Hubble parameter. The maxima are approximately in the same places and the minima are approximately in the same places. It could not be the chance. The quasars are at the distances of billions of the light years, and the map of anisotropy of Hubble parameter is constructed for a near zone. But they do coincide. Already, very few people doubt that the universe structure as a whole and its evolution are defined by its arrangement at the deepest level. Macrocosm is inseparably connected to the microcosm, and in this level physics also confronts serious problems. The superstring theory is now the mainstream in physics. It is the most advanced front of physics. It predicts 10 in the 100th power, even 10 in the 1000th power different types of the worlds. It turns out that the superstring theory describes anything you like, any world that you want. It turns out that this is senseless to ask a question why our world is arranged like this. Because the only answer that the superstring theory can give is that it is a historical event. We can have such world, but could have another as well. Here is the simplest analogy. No sense asking why Madagascar Island has such form and such size from the point of view of physics. It could have any form and size. The only common thing for all islands is the laws of physical geography. This is the situation with the universe from the viewpoint of the superstring theory. It is senseless to ask why our universe is such but not another. Of course, in a sense, this is a beautiful point of view, but really it means a total surrender. We refuse to understand the world because we cannot ask why our world is